welcome to Project PEP. Over the next few minutes, we would like to share with you some of the dreams and aspirations that have flowed from this bus, La Tortuga. In 1967, the Bracero migrant workers in Sarita would study a practical educational curriculum in the evenings. But more than that, they were formulating the dreams of a better way of life for themselves and their children. And over these last four decades, we've seen the betterment in housing, self-employment, micro-business, education, and many other areas that have improved the quality of the lives of our rural communities, not only here in Arizona, but nationally and internationally. We started with the motto of Si Se Puede, which means yes, we can. And now because of the history and the legacy of those that have toiled in the fields, we can now say Si Se Pudo, which yes, we have been able to accomplish this. So we welcome you and invite you to share in this great experience of the dreams of the people from La Tortuga. And there are a number of programs that uh, PEP has developed and delivered to the communities throughout Southern Arizona, beginning with housing, education, uh, programs for the disabled, transportation, uh, you name it, uh, PEP's been involved. Summertime means plenty of fresh vegetables and fruits in your favorite produce market. We enjoy some of the cheapest prices in the world. And as Michael Kalman reports, it's because migrant farm workers are some of the lowest paid people in the world. There are more than 5 million men, women, and children in this country who follow the growing seasons traveling from farm to farm, job to job. They are the migrant farm workers. Um, the employment training programs um, do a number of different things with farm workers and then also in the general population with, in conjunction with the One Stop. So we're working with farm worker adults um, across the state, mostly in southern Arizona. It's giving them that opportunity to go back to school to learn things because what's happening is a lot of times the young people, the farm worker children, are teaching the parents and, and, and the families there. And so it's giving them an opportunity to re-educate so that they can communicate with their own children when it comes to education and going back to school. This is Eyewitness News 4 at 5. The new Farm Worker Hall of Fame was unveiled right here in Tucson. The idea is to recognize the people who have put food on our tables for day after day for generations. Hall of Fame shows the changes through the years to the farming industry, much like the sports halls of fame. We're standing above the Aravaca Community Garden. My name is Bill Stern and I'm the farm manager here. This program started in 1998 and it was created to serve the communities of Aravaca, Amato, and Green Valley. And our main purpose is to provide training and education to the people in our community about sustainable organic farming and uh, to make sure that there's always plenty of fresh produce available to the people here. These turnips are a Japanese variety of white turnips that are excellent and they're very popular at the markets. They have a really, really nice mild flavor and we sell a lot of these and we've been growing these for many years. Dr. Arnold is um, impressive in the scope of the way he thinks. He's, he's taken uh, one small thing over 40 years and, and turned it into quite an amazing place to, to work and uh, an operation that just has a great deal of impact on the people in Arizona and uh, in Mexico and all over the place. He's just, there never seems to be some sort of uh, end wall to where he wants to help people. It just keeps expanding and expanding. PEP started as a you know, portable educational preparation, right? And La Tortuga here, we're standing in front of La Tortuga. And uh, it continues to provide education for the last 15 years through PEP Tech, uh, which is a charter school, charter high school, uh, with 11 sites throughout Southern Arizona, beginning uh, all the way in San Luis, uh, here in Tucson, a lot of places. And these are students who may not have other opportunities. 
and or else they've tried they've been participating in um, uh, regular high schools public high schools and for one reason or another it hasn't worked for them and PEP provides a second opportunity. I went to school in uh, Jose Yepes Learning Center which is a PEP Tech high school in Summerton, Arizona which is mainly a farm worker community that is approximately 15 minutes north of the border of Sonora. Well PEP Tech high school was different in the sense of the smaller class ratio and also the sense of motivation that the teachers have with the students. They have a closer relationship, uh, not just educational wise, but personal wise as well. They help you uh, uh, be able to solve any problems that you may have, not only in school, but outside of school as well, with any counseling. It, it comes from the heart, okay. Based on my relationship with PEP and the great job that they have done here in education, when the regular high school closes its doors in our youth, they do have a hope, and that hope got a name, it's called PEP. And I see the parents struggle with their kids and I see the kids struggle in a regular environment in a regular high school. But when they go to PEP, they, they, you, can, you can see the parents relax, you can see the pride on the kids. We've been in existence since 1995 and we've graduated over 2,500 students. And I, would, I don't know the exact figures, but I would be afraid to think of how many kids who would, who would have not gotten a high school diploma had an option like this not been available to them. Well, I think our students have to be evaluated in other ways than just standardized test scores. I like to look at our kids as individuals, and I like to see where they've been and where they've gotten to. Um, we, we're not going to have probably a lot of students go to MIT, for example, but we are going to train students to be able to go out and be productive members in the workforce, maybe the military, in community colleges and four-year universities. PEP plays a vital role in this process. There's a significant number of students who for many of the reasons I mentioned, the social, the economic reasons, the work and family realities, the children are not focused on education. These children later may opt to go back to school, but it's too late. They're grade levels behind. This is again where the PEP programs, youth build programs, the charter school programs that are the second opportunity for these populations to come in becomes a very valuable avenue, a very valuable door. I'm a sophomore at Pep Tech High. I attend Pep Tech High School because I wanted to get my credits faster and because they pay more attention to you and they teach you better. Hi, my name is Jesus Fimbres. I'm a senior at Pep Tech. I like Pep Tech because it's more one-on-one -on -one with the students. The most I like about Pep Tech is that it's faster and it's easier and you always have one-on-one -on -one with your teachers. If it wasn't for Pep, um, I don't know where I'd be. <laughs> My future plans are to, to move on to a, a better career or job or maybe own my own business. What I like the most about Pep Tech is that they're really flexible. The, the Friday schedule, I mean, they work with you. If you're working, they work with you. And the teachers, they go out of their way to help you. And I appreciate it. Pep Tech's cool. I'm the lead teacher here in, in Cesar Javis Learning Center. And um, we provide services um, for students who have been dropped out from other high schools. Um, we have a lot of students who are single mothers, who students um, who are farm workers. They're still working and coming to school. And as, al as we always say, um, we have been the last opportunity for most of them. Uh, PEP California is the parent organization that's, uh, that hosts a uh, high school, Los Angeles Online High School. Uh, it's a charter high school. And uh, basically we try to serve the needs of, of uh, students in, I believe it's five different counties. Los Angeles County being the largest, of course. There are many different stories and types of students that can benefit from this type of education. People who uh, need to work in order to help support their family and would like to be able to continue their education on their own at home in hours that are more uh, appropriate for them to be able to do both. And so that's, that's the needs that, uh, that uh, PEP fulfills in California.
With the support of the federal government, 110 farm workers from Yuma County graduate with their general equivalency diplomas. A great ceremony tonight. Ty Greenfield found out why Yuma's practical education preparation program is so successful. Ty? Jim and Perrette, many of the graduates you're about to see won't let a full day of hard work underneath the hot Arizona sun stop them from getting the most they can out of life. Dr. Celestino Fernandez knows what it's like to come to the United States and not know English. In my own experience, I was quite scared of not knowing a single word of English, and everything was in a foreign language. Fernandez went from working the fields to earning a degree at Stanford yeah, so University. He spoke at today's PEP graduation because he believes in the program. In the off-season months, when there's less produce to pick, Yuma's job market tends to be as dried out as this field. This program gives uh, all farm workers opportunity that they uh, don't get, you know, anywhere else. Founder of the program, Dr. John David Arnold, hopes education will be a family affair. It's a really high-quality program where both the parents and the young people are, are studying it through Project PEP. Okay. The HEP program is a high school equivalency program funded to the U.S. Department of Education, Department of Migrant Education. Everyone in our program has worked in agriculture or their parents are involved in agriculture. So it gives us a great deal of pleasure to be able to help our students uh, continue with their educations. Affordable, modern housing is difficult for most to find, whether or not they're able to keep their jobs on the farm. The Assistant Deputy Secretary of the Department of Labor is visiting the Tucson area to see the progress made in housing and job retraining. That's portable, practical education preparation. Peggy Giddings has our cover story. Jose Salina was unable to be there when his wife and daughter welcomed Labor Department official John Flores to their home near Sarita, south of Tucson. Salinas job at the Farmers Investment Company is proof just as tangible as his home that conditions for former farm workers in southern Arizona are improving. Jose Salina was among the many workers employed by pecan growers. At one time he and his family lived in a camp much like this one. At one time there were three such camps. Now this is the only one left and it is used only for transitional housing. So it's kind of an interesting uh, full circle now we see families that have come out of the farm labor camps now living in their own homes they have the dignity and pride of home ownership and also the incomes are diver diversified some have stayed with the farm it's been a permanent labor source others have moved on and uh, maybe some are one family member still working for the farm and someone's working for another business or a golf course or whatever so it's provided dual income for the families the Selena home is one of several built with the help of Project PEP. It's a sweat equity concept where families um, go together. In this case, 13 families built their homes. They got individual mortgages at 30 years at 1% interest. And they built their homes under supervision of PEP Housing Development Corporation. I think it's fantastic. What we, we're seeing is, is grassroots uh, uh, doing things that... Uh, uh, make the big bureaucracy responsive to, to local community needs and we're seeing as our PEP program doing that. For, one of the reasons I'm really out here is to look at the, what unique things uh, our PEP program is doing with housing. I think it's really kind of setting a national tone because with limited resources what we're doing is leveraging the dollars to get other agencies to put in dollars such as HUD, DSDA. You know, the youth build program, for example, the, 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 uh, ties very well with our, pro with our self-help program. We have, we have a self-help family program. It's a USDA program that basically puts together families to build their own homes. So we like that concept a lot, getting people together so they can do something together instead of individually. And the youth build, it's, it's a pretty good example of what happens That's when yes. you put together a, a training program that actually uh, has a, 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 a very different benefit, which is a house for a family. But along the way, kids learn more than that. You know, they, they learn more than just to build a home. They, they learn to work together. They, um, they get their uh, schooling done. Um, and they learn a trade, which is something that essentially, uh, it's, it's, if you don't have the educational background, you certainly need to get the training, the vocational training. 
youth build is going strong. Um, and it's all because of the people that are sitting here and all of you that were recognized because of our outstanding partners, our outstanding community members, and the people that support us and work with our young people and supporting them for a better future in education and the youth build staff. But of all, Jesse Lopez has been um, just an outstanding asset to this community and to this program. We started this program in 2003. 2003, this program is designed to the, uh, the teenagers who drop out from the high school for the age of the 17 to 24 years old. Men or women who want to apply, then they qualify under the Department of Labor, they like uh, uh, have the uh, income from agriculture. Most of these folks have been doing their jobs for years. Then there are the assistants for very special assistance. They're clients of Project PEP, an organization that mainstreams the disabled into society. Although they're adults, they function on the average more like an eight-year-old. Silky, she's, uh, or she is, she's a doll. She works hard. She's a, she's a person that we just leave alone and tell her what she needs to do, and, uh, and she accomplishes that. Steve is proud of his work. He's very good at it, too. For a few years, he's been here at La Posada, a retirement community, stocking shelves. The Project PEP clients work about 20 hours a week here. They don't get paid as much as the other workers, but it's more than enough to make them proud. Oh, yeah. This is usually the focal point in their life. Um, they love it. They just love it. Richard never used to talk much before he started working here. Lately, he's become much more comfortable around people, actually initiating conversations at times. Then, there's Robert. Oh, Robert, he, he's, <laughs> he entertains us always. He's got his little guitar that, uh, that he pretends he has, and uh, he sings the Spanish songs. There are a lot of cooks in this kitchen, but they always come up with the perfect recipe. Kathy Ryan, TV4 Eyewitness News. The Encompass Division stands for Enhanced Community Participation and Support Services. We work with people with cognitive disabilities or developmental disabilities. We've been doing that since 1979, where throughout the state of Arizona, individuals with disabilities, severe disabilities, that may require significant supports from um, staff members or from the community are able to live in homes just like you live in and I live in. They get to go to work just like you have a job and I have a job. Every accomplishment, no matter how small, is rewarded. Good job, John. Good job. Good job. Meet the residents of the Santa Thomas House. Six men ranging from the ages of 43 to 71 live here, and each one has a very distinctive personality. Staff members help the men deal with their disabilities with individualized attention. What color is that? Green, right. You want to put the green one in? Okay. Yes, Ron's favorite is to work with puzzles. Ron did this all by himself up until this point. He fits the pieces together really well. Some of the men were institutionalized when they were younger because of their disabilities. Others stayed at home until their parents could no longer care for them. These guys are learning stuff every day just like me and you. There's new experiences for them. We go places that they haven't been and I find that in my own life it's the same way. The men make the decisions yeah. here. They have the choice of doing whatever they want to because this is truly their home. I believe that the change has to come from within that person. It needs to be a personal change or a willingness to try and figure out what is the situation or what the problem is. Jorge and Rosario have been together three months. They admit it's not been easy, but they're willing to work at it one day at a time. And with the tools they've learned in counseling, they feel they can only succeed. Both will be going to marriage counseling as well. It's real easy to get in trouble. It's, yeah, let me say hard to get out. That's what Tyrone Sisko says happened to his stepbrother, Willie Rogers. Rogers is one of three Reedo teenagers charged with murdering a Tucson convenience store clerk and robbing two stores. Rogers' mother says her son had too much time on his hands. 
Well, right now we're trying to do the best we can for William, you know. And it's just something that, you know, it wasn't jobs. He needed, you know, these children need support. You know, they need someone to stand by them, you know, and help them, guard them, you know, and stuff. And the really toe doesn't have this. I think I should feel privileged for my mom, for my parents, both of them, my father and my mother. I don't really see parents really getting involved with their sons or daughters, you know, sitting down, talking to them, you know, making them understand what, you know, if, if you don't get an education, you know, there's nothing in life, you know, out there for you. I came through the public school system and I came through because I had a family that was supportive of education. I had older brothers and sisters who told me that I was going to go to school, woke me up and made sure that I did. And so that it was not so much the system as my family that had that support. Living on a reservation rather than in an urban area isn't necessarily the answer. Frequently it adds to the difficulty, says Baya. On the reservation, we are dealing with uh, such a gap for example, from grandma to the, to the grandkids, because the kid is tied into the TV, and the grandma is trying to um, raise the traditional mode of a family. So you have those values that are conflicting, and that pulls these young uh, students. So that's where we see a lot of Indian students really lacking direction, lacking, uh, you might call, a vision of what they want to do down the road. So. It's a complicated uh, thing, but uh, nevertheless, it's something that needs to be addressed. Facing a 25-hour journey to the southeast, three truckloads full of relief supplies headed out of Tucson today. The donations came through Peptech Charter Schools, World Care, and the League of American Citizens. Armed with sleeping bags, water, clothing, medical supplies, even pet food, the workers hope to reach areas that have not been touched by government aid. We know that the situation is just total squalor, de uh, devastation uh, that's unimaginable. People just have no concept of, of what is hit down there. Certainly the biggest catastrophe of this nation. Hurricane Henriette is long gone, but the effects are just now being felt just south of the border. In Sonora, 24,000 families are homeless. Many of them are farm workers who lost everything. The PEP Rural Service Organization here in Tucson is coordinating a mass effort to collect much-needed items like clothes, non-perishable food items, and bedding. As neighbors, uh, it doesn't matter if there's a border there or not. If people are suffering, then we as uh, neighbors, it's our job to respond. You can drop off the items all weekend at any PEP charter school location. They will be delivered next week. PEP Micro Business and Housing Development Corporation has made more than a thousand loans to rural Arizona entrepreneurs. We're calling it a bridge into the 21st century. The bus behind John Arnold is where Project PEP started more than 30 years ago. La Tortuga, or the turtle, carried Arnold's dreams of helping the less fortunate. Through micro lending, Project PEP has been helping budding entrepreneurs start or expand their businesses since 1987. A micro loan can be as small as $200. Our average loan is about $2,700. Microlending is about giving people with low incomes a chance to pursue a dream of owning their own business. In fact, the federal government encourages it. They've put up millions of dollars for microloans. You see, Uncle Sam wants to assist one million low-income people to help them start their own businesses. We do microenterprise loans for small businesses in the communities that do not have access to capital from regular institutions financial institutions. We do also uh, training along with the loans that we provide to them. There's one specific one of this lady that started out with a very promising and you know enthusiasm about starting her own business. She started it out of her home, actually out of her living room. She uh, came to PEP and asked for the first time loan. I remember we gave her a very minimum amount and she started uh, buying um, dresses and women clothing and accessories and started selling out. And as time went by, she was able to move out of her home into a shop and um, this was a very small shop. Then she went moved on to a medium-sized one and right now she's 
in a bigger place and has uh, created jobs. Welcome to Bella Fashion number two, uh, located in Yuma, Arizona. I'm very, I'm very proud about my new store because I have a very good location and uh, more space. And uh, we have uh, many more clients, customers. I'm so grateful because about 43, 45% of 43 businesses in this uh, shopping center that I started is a micro business to help our people get ahead. It's a total success because of the program, the micro program, the micro loans that uh, Cecilia Torres is running for PEP. And it's an outstanding program. Ruth Alvarez owns an insurance and title business in Nogales, Arizona. She opened seven years ago and now has four full-time employees. But there are times when Alvarez needs a small loan for business improvements or just to get by. However, getting a small loan through the bank can be a hassle. So when Alvarez found out about low interest loans available through the micro industry credit rural organization, she took advantage of it. You know, there's some off months, you know, the tourists are off and, and season's off, the produce season locally. And so we do have rough months for about two or three months. And yeah, it does help for payroll and to purchase equipment or break down equipment and for repair of such items. Micro officials say the goal is to help those who may otherwise be earning low incomes to become self-employed and to have a chance to succeed. A royal visit to a local school right here in Tucson. King Nana Otobrebi III stopped by Pep Tech Public Charter High School today to talk to students about the importance of their education. His Royal Highness is the King of Baika people of Ghana and West Africa, and he wants students to think globally to find out where they fit in the world and have broad horizons when they're searching for what they want to become. He also says he wants to take part of the American culture back with him to Ghana. So I'm kind of a bridge between these two cultures. I will bring this in and you take this out. Instead of trying to shield or build a wall between cultures, I'm sort of being a bridge between the cultures. King Otrebrebi took the throne back in July of 2007, becoming one of Africa's youngest and newest kings. He is currently living and working here in Tucson as part of the Ghana Project and will return to his kingdom in December. December. How lucky are they? What an amazing experience. And it is so true. You have to think globally. Don't just think in your state. Don't just think in our country. Think of all the different countries where you can make a difference. So definitely Nigeria being one of the most populous countries in Africa. Mm -hmm. If people get to know the best way to live, they spread the good message, and I think it will go a long way to help the continent and Nigerians in general. Well, we believe he can do a lot to help uh, the teeming population who are almost dying now on uh, diabetics. And I'm sure, you know, diabetes is caused by the food you eat. That's what I believe, anyway. I'm not a doc medical doctor, but uh, I believe that um, most of the things we eat contribute to the fact that we have diabetes in our lives. So his visit to Nigeria will really help the people understand and learn the best way of life to live, especially relating to what we eat. Francisco Panza, Director General of Fulton. I have a personal letter from uh, the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico, Ambassador Patricia Espinosa who is very aware of the job Dr. Arnold has been doing all this time. I take advantage of the, of the opportunity to recognize the outstanding job EPIP has done under the leadership. I have no doubt in my mind that your commitment has contributed directly to increase the quality of life of our community. I have received reports that in close collaboration with the Mexican consulate in Tucson, Arizona, you have achieved important goals in the educational field. You have my deepest and most sincere recognition for your dedication and commitment. I invite you to continue with this important educational cause in favor of the migrant community. Sincerely, Patricia Espinosa, Secretary of Foreign Affairs of Mexico. From the government of Mexico to PPIP for the outstanding job you have done. Dr. Arnold and King of Tortuga, Rolling, as you have done for the last three years.
They're working with a lot of kids that are abandoned from the border roundups in the U.S. These children are sent back accompanied by an adult, which they may have supposed were their parents, but when they get to the border, they're abandoned. So they find a way to picking these kids up after they're left off by the buses, and they are brought back into uh, finding out where their parents may be, if they're even able to be located, because some of these kids are, are so young they can't verbalize where they were or where their home might be. So there's some very serious things going on uh, with children in this part of the country on both sides of the border. This place is for us a home, not really a center. We have established the model of a home for the children, young adults, and the children of the community that come here. Family is very important, and we have that sense of family here. Because education liberates us. ¿Qué carrera están pensando algunos de ustedes? What career? Por ejemplo, ¿tienes tu idea qué quieres hacer? Diseño gráfico. Design graphics. Maestra. Education. Engineer. Minister. Pastor. Engineer. I've known John Arnold, uh, Dr. Arnold, for a lot of years since uh, uh, since I was first city manager in South Tucson, and then uh, when I was county manager. And, and in those days, uh, John was always uh, looking for funds to promote uh, issues related to to the farm workers and and people in rural areas who needed assistance. In in all those years, I I grew to to admire John's uh, ability to reach out in in areas that were uh, less accessible to just regular services and health care and, and all kinds of service delivery that the people in, in government and public service, you know, we work at providing those, but it's, it's tougher in rural areas. This program is so unique in the people that it serves. This here actually works for the people and it actually helps people, you know, and you can kind of see that. So it, it makes it kind of exciting to, to be a part of, of, of this board here. and. Uh, then, you know, I, I've watched Dr. Arnold and, and the work that he does, you know, from, from Mexico to Africa to India, you know, uh, I like to call him the Sam Walton of, of uh, uh, a charter schools. you know. Here, here's an individual who just worked quietly behind the scenes and they built, you know, a mega empire that's helping people, you know, and, and uh, I watch him uh, gather clothing and stuff to take to areas where they've been hit by uh, different natural disasters or whatever. So to say that you're a part of that and, and when it's happening and people know to say, well, hey, I sit on that board, it, it gives you your own self-worth that you're a part of something good. PEP and its management team have a very strong track record of operating in, in easier times and tougher times both. And uh, their track record is very strong, very good and uh, they seem to be able to manage money very well and, and anticipate problems like uh, reductions in funding from government agencies ahead of time and position themselves to uh, be able to accept that and keep on going. The audits have been very good, have been very clean uh, and uh, reflect a sound operating company. I have really enjoyed being and knowing all the different ones in Project PEP and knowing that they were there when different ones needed it and when we needed it, they were able to help us. Without Project PEP helping us, we would have not been able to do the things that we've been able to do. I've always said, this is an organization. The PEP organization all across the board is out there to help people in need 
to help themselves. Project PEP has helped my community since 1978 when we started back then as self-help uh, housing project. Uh, back then, uh, we came to Project PEP, uh, most of them farm workers from the pecan growers in the Saudita area. And Project PEP was able to help us, including my family, build our own homes. One of the things that PEP has always been to this community is a, a, a resource, you know, for services um, like if they needed weatherization or help with utilities, you know, if you were a farm worker, you could get that. And one of the things that PEP did once it got off the ground and got started, they have a training program, uh, you know, where they could teach skills to the ex-farm workers and, you know, people um, who wanted to get their CDL license, they could also do that. Uh, me and Dr. John Arnolds met together when I was involved in the mural movement uh, in the early 80s and uh, he was very impressed with my work. He gave me that opportunity uh, to um, flourish with PEP and uh, give the community a different perspective in the art world. And to be working on the farm, that is really hard. I mean, you could work there two years, five years, and it's like if you had to work 15 or 20 years, it's really it's really um, a back-breaking job. I mean, it, and, the, and the pay is not there, and the conditions are not there. I mean, it's just, it's really tough, it is. So we're very grateful with, to work with PEP. We've supported them 100%. Um, we are working with them to try to expand their operations because we need, there's so much demand for it. So we want to definitely continue that relationship. And we've helped them, assist them during hard times these last years because there's been cutbacks and we want to make sure that they continue that. So we've, out of our general fund, had contributed to those programs so they continue that. One more. I just want to congratulate you on this wonderful day and for your 50 years of fantastic service to the world community, really. Great. Well, thank you so much. We want to thank you for sharing with us the lives and experiences of the Bracero migrant workers that studied aboard this bus in 1967 with a dream that their lives could be improved and that of their children. And the projects that you have seen had the steps that have been taken toward self-sufficiency and a better way of life. Now they can say with pride that beyond si se puede, si se pudo. Thank you. ser inmigrante y cruzar como ilegal los coyotes te maltratan les da todos por igual ni de día ni de noche hay clemencia en el desierto de aquí pocos salen vivos cada año en cientos. The biggest Mexican in, 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 in Tucson is a white guy named Arnold. The biggest African American <laughs> in Tucson is a white guy named Arnold. And I sit back and I look at him and I say, yeah, because he's addressing all our issues. Desierto y el calor no es buena combinación. Muchos encuentran la muerte por la deshidratación. Es 
momento tengan lo presente, no se les vaya a olvidar que por ganarse la vida, muertos pueden terminar. La temperatura sube y también la probabilidad. Hombres y mujeres en el desierto han quedado sin auxilio de ninguno, muertos ya y abandonado. Queremos que el inmigrante nos escuche y nos entienda, no queremos que no vengan, simplemente que no mueran, nuestra meta es impedir las muertes en el desierto, con el calor sube el riesgo, eso tenganlo por cierto. Quieren sobrevivir, prestenme ya su atención. La mejor defensa siempre es bajo la prevención. Vuela, vuela, palomita, para tener aquel pitayo. No es lo mismo ir caminando que montar. Aquí termina el corrido, no se les vaya a olvidar, protéjanse del calor, si el desierto hay que Aquellos gigantes sigue rogándole a Dios por todos los inmigrantes. ¡Sí se puede! ¡Sí se pudo!